Thanks, Steve. It, it's uh, great to be back in academia, at least for a short um, time, although I'm going to be very critical of, of academia today, but I know you can take it because I, I came from a place uh, like this. Uh, I do have opinions on everything, but you'll probably uh, learn that I've been practicing a lot and suppressing opinions right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is sort of take off on a couple of uh, topics uh, that hopefully will um, generate even more discussion during the panel. And the perspective I'll take is really looking at it from the point of view of the FDA, which is sitting in the middle of something called HHS, which is sitting in the middle of something called the executive branch of the federal government, which is closely overseen by Congress, which you all um, pay attention to. And about the only thing I can find that they all agree on is that precision medicine is a great concept. They seem to all agree on that. And um, that's turned out to be extraordinarily positive, I think, for what I would have to say at this uh, meeting. And, and especially, you know, people ask, why did you come to the FDA in the first place? And I, I would say this is an extraordinary time in biomedical science of all types, including what you're discussing today. And the president we have right now is, I can just tell you personally, is amazingly astute and knowledgeable about biomedical science. He can, could probably hold a discussion with any of you about the details of either genomics or transparency of data and hold his own pretty well with uh, any of you. So what are, I'm just going to give you a list of some of the things that we're working on that pertain to what I believe you're talking about this meeting, although I sort of stumbled in still in a daze after surviving two hours of having my entire life examined by Congress with my family sitting behind me. And, um, and, and I'll start with uh, next generation sequencing. It's the only relatively basic science topic I'm going to talk about. But it begins at the FDA for me because we have, a, we have an extraordinary opportunity and a major problem in this country right now which is that our best academic medical centers are tearing up the airwaves with advertisements about how they can cure every disease known to man. If you just come to that particular academic center and get their special brewed up tests that they make in their center. But we don't know if the same person went to five different great academic medical centers whether they would get the same result, even for really serious things like what's your chemotherapy gonna be for cancer. And now we're in this situation, and the next thing that's about to happen is the radical availability of next generation sequencing, um, which is dropping precipitously in cost. It's going to be available pretty generally, fairly quickly. And so we go from uh, regulating one test at a time, which we're having trouble doing now, to dealing with three billion base pairs or whatever it is that's going to pop out of the computer and be in your electronic record. And so, um, to me, this is sort of the ultimate uh, extrapolation, a part of what you've been talking about. The proposal that we've been working on with the NIH, which has, I think, been very well received and is well underway, <clears throat> is to create a data commons. And the concept would be that um, working with NIH and patient advocacy groups, we put together a large and growing base of data from people who have donated their samples and clinical data. And then companies and universities that want to do next generation sequencing and offer the clinical test for a price can publicly display the operating characteristics of the tests that they're developing. And the FDA can look at it, but so can the rest of you. To me, it sort of would be the ultimate of open science. Now, that would pretty radically change the playing field, but it's probably the only possible way you could think of bringing order to just having tests done everywhere and very few people understanding uh, what they mean. The second uh, area I'm going to talk about is, are the collaborations we're having with NIH. And that, that's why at the beginning I said we're nested um, in an organization um, which is really focused uh, on a lot of what you're talking about right now. <clears throat> we have a thing called the uh, NIH FDA Leadership Council. We identify topics and then we work together on those topics. And the first one I'll just mention, I, I just call it outcomes, but right now we're mostly focused on biomarkers, but the intention is to go through the different things that you can measure. This relates partly to what Deborah brought up. We started out saying, let's look at biomarkers. There's a lot of elegant systems biology and things that we need to all be thinking about. But as we talked with, with each other, we realized that even in the room with NIH Institute directors and leaders at the FDA, when we used the term, we often meant entirely different things. 
And so we spent the last four months in raucous face-to-face -face meetings to try to come up with a glossary of terms to describe outcomes that you can measure in clinical trials. Then we started out with major differences. We're about to go public with this. It'll be a living document, so it's not meant to be the final word, but uh, our belief is if the NIH and the FDA agree on it and the clinical community participates in it, a lot of what's happening in the, in the peer-reviewed science community where at the end of projects, people are now realizing sometimes they were just completely off in the wrong arena as they were trying to translate. And we see entire companies started on an erroneous view of how a biomarker can be used as a surrogate endpoint, as an example. The next area uh, is clinical trials. That's really, uh, of course, what I love. And uh, we have three uh, pretty interesting projects that are well underway right now. The first is with clinicaltrials.gov. And the goal of the project we're working on between FDA and NIH is um, to understand how we can best use clinicaltrials.gov as a tool. How can we work together to optimize uh, the availability of the information that's in it and to set examples of how to use it? A really good example is what Mike Lauer has done with portfolio analysis at, analysis at NHLBI, uh, actually using clinicaltrials.gov as a tool to look at what's being done. I published a number of papers on this right before I came to FDA, including the one that Deborah mentioned. And there was a university fairly close to this room, as I remember, was in single digits in terms of um, registration in clinicaltrials.gov, Steve. So I hope that record is picking up at this point. Foothill College did some Oh, Foothill College, okay. So um, I, I think as we make the evidence that's in there transparent, people will pick up their game. Um, and we also, as Deborah alluded to, have a separate group that's working on the final rule about implementation of the law related to clinicaltrials.gov. That's critical to me because FDA has the enforcement responsibility, and we don't really feel we should be enforcing in a major way with up to $10,000 a day in fines per infraction until we've got a very clear agreement on exactly what it means and people have adequate opportunity to clean up their shops. In the academic uh, community, I also feel like I have to mention again, industry is doing better than academia, significantly better in terms of clinical trial registration and results reporting. NIH, I think, has the fix, which is basically you won't get your next grant if you haven't registered and reported your previous trial. So I'm pretty happy that that change is being made because, frankly, it's embarrassing to be criticizing industry so much when uh, your own shop is looking uh, relatively poor. But, but we're working on that. Um, also mentioned that um, NIH was noticing that there were a lot of clinical trials being done. One thing that puzzled me when we first did our analysis of clinicaltrials.gov is that if we looked at trials that either never finished, uh, were never reported, or were never cited, the vast majority were tiny little studies done in academic medical centers. Far and away the vast majority. That was puzzling. And what I've learned in our leadership council is there are a lot of trials that NIH funds indirectly through universities and centers that don't have protocols. And so we've been working with the NIH to develop a protocol template to assure that when people um, apply to IRBs, they don't just have an IRB application, but they actually have a protocol with things like a specified uh, endpoint of the trial. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled, uh, Rick alluded to this, but um, there's an effort now to change the peer review system for clinical trials at NIH, and I think it's going to be a big improvement. It's not my area, but um, it's something that you all should really pay attention to. Um, and then I'll quickly go through a couple of other things. Within the FDA, two big things that we're working on, and uh, I was actually not as aware of this as I should have been, but there's an agreement with pharma and the FDA through the user fee negotiations that within about the next two years, you won't be able to submit your data to the FDA unless you use uh, the common data standards that have been agreed to uh, between pharma and the FDA. We're doing a little catch up with the NIH because to me it's kind of silly to have sort of a global enterprise that has a common set of, dem of data standards, but the very systems and centers that are enrolling patients in the trials have another set of things they're working on with the NIH. So that's another thing that we're working on together. But for you all, I think it'll be a major improvement if the data as it's coming in is actually collected according to common standards and terminology. And then we have Sentinel, 
which is, uh, as many of you know, uh, right now uh, has 170 million Americans uh, worth of claims data, including every prescription written, and very good follow-up data. It's done through the public health exception to the common rules so that uh, consent is not required and it's only used when FDA, uh, for a public health measure when FDA has a question about drug safety. But it's a tool which we're going to expand very carefully um, in conjunction uh, with a lot of other people because it can be the backbone of a new system of clinical trials. Uh, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago that included almost every federal agency. And if we look at PCORnet, which I was very involved with, 100 million Americans' uh, health systems uh, linked together into a clinical trials network, the NIH Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory, and other efforts. We're on the verge of a tipping point, I think, where randomization within big data will become the norm, which means that um, hopefully we'll begin to do a very high, very much higher proportion of clinical trials that actually answer a meaningful question. And if you ask me what the biggest problem is today in the clinical trial system, it's that most trials that are being done don't answer meaningful questions. And if you don't believe it, analyze clinicaltrials.gov and look at it within any specialty. And then finally, um, coming back to precision medicine, um, a very critical part of all this, um, uh, which, which has been pretty amazing for me to participate in, is uh, the putting of the patients or consumers, in the case of um, other parts of the FDA, in the center not just recipients of the analyses we do, but involved at the very front end in designing the studies, participating um, in the follow-up during the studies, participating in the analysis and the dissemination of the results. And I'll just use the example with permission, my uh, mom, who I got to use at the hearing, she was sitting right behind me, and was a pretty effective advocate for me, I'll have to say, at age uh, 88. She's a seven-year survivor of multiple myeloma, and if you look at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, it's an amazing system because here you have a, a very high proportion of people with multiple myeloma have banded together. They've said, we want our samples and our data to be used by the research community. You've got to show us that you've got credentials. We're not just throwing it out there. It's behind a, set, a firewall that can be looked at. We have a quality system for data collection. We're monitoring you, and as you as an academic center do a sloppy job, uh, we're going to kick you out of our system. And we're also going to look at the quality of care that you deliver. And we're looking for the next clinical trial to participate in. We want you to do clinical trials so that we can have questions answered. The result of that is the FDA has approved four or five new treatments just in the last year for multiple myeloma. My mother has had three occasions where she's become refractory. And just as that happens, a new treatment gets on the market due to this rapid turnover and participation system uh, that she's responded to, and 88, she was still there to defend me in front of the senators. So um, that's sort of a summary of a lot of the things that we're doing. And I really think um, the core issues are patient participation, academia has to clean up its shop and get out of the ego business and get into the business of answering questions that matter to the patients. But the beauty is I think the patients are gradually and increasingly going to take control and if in academia you don't answer the questions they want, there's a very high chance you won't get funded because they're going to have a lot to say about it. So thanks. <laughs>